The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 743 for Monday, January 7th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab. The show where we take all the things that you send into us, your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We take some cool stuff found and tips that we find of our own. We try to answer your questions. We try to answer our questions with the goal being that each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include OpsGenie at OpsGenie.com. ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash MGG. Text Expander at textexpander.com slash podcast. And Captera at captera.com slash MGG. We'll talk more in detail about all of those in a moment. Here in Las Vegas, Nevada, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, very close to Dave Hamilton, um, this is in Las Vegas, Nevada. John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Well, you know, the travel thing actually wasn't too bad. Well, that's I, good. I gotta say I'm uh, good with uh, Delta, and I think you did uh, JetBlue, and uh, we made it from our various Northeast uh, locations to we did. Las Vegas. Yeah. And um, it's a, uh, um, I don't know. I have my reservations about Vegas, my friend. Okay. Because Okay. <laughs> as far as cities to do trade shows in, I'm not a big fan of Vegas. I, I much rather prefer the little ditties that you and I do in Manhattan or um, like Macworld Expo, San Francisco. So I'm sorry, huh. no, uh, but I still like Vegas. That's, um, see, that's interesting. Vegas I think- has a draw. In that there's entertainment, there's there's all sorts of things going on with Vegas. Yeah, see, I I think Las Vegas is the best city for a, a trade show because really, like, yeah, because New York's a pain in the neck. Um, you can't get everybody in like close proximity to each other. Uh, you know, and I'm talking like a large trade show, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, like the Javits, there's nothing near it, so you've got to always travel to it. Uh, the and San Francisco is ridiculously expensive, right? For to put on a conference and to stay okay. and all of that. Like, I don't know. I, San Francisco was a good location though. Cause you could stay right in there. Um, I do, I do like San Jose for, for WWDC. Obviously that's, but hmm. that wouldn't work for a show this size, but for a show this size, Vegas is great, right? Cause you got enough hotel rooms. It's easy to get around here now with Uber and Lyft. I don't know. I, I'll give you that. Yeah. Um, I think I like it. Yeah. I mean, for CES, I would say, and then we'll uh, you will hear our coverage, but CES is, it's too much for <laughs> any one person to handle. And that, Dave, I got through my 500 emails from people telling me about all the great things they were going to tell me about it. 500 in just the last week, you mean? Uh, yeah, something like that. But anyways, the thing is, everybody, if you're on the CES press list, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, and that's, that's why John and I are here, right? Because it, it, our goal is not to cover the entirety of CES. That would be, nobody can do that. That's it, well, crazy. it would also be not all that interesting because there's just so much that happens here. So we come and bring our perspective and filter it down and try and kind of cut through the noise. So we'll be doing that this week. There, there actually isn't anything yet to cover. Um, but uh, so we have what essentially it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this. We do a while we're here in Vegas, we do a normal show where we answer questions that have come in all week. And then when we get back from Vegas, when we're in our homes, in our normal environment, that's where we usually do the show that's about CES. But I was thinking, John, there's no reason we can't do a second podcast this week. It doesn't have to be like a full 90 minutes. Nobody says we can't like do maybe a a 20 or 30 minute show midweek if we want from CES about CES after we've been to something. So watch your feeds, folks, because you never know. It might happen for now. Uh, 
let's do this, right? So let's go to, uh, so obviously we're here in the hotel room. Things will sound a little different, but you've already figured that out. So let's go to Jason and, uh, and share a series of quick tips from him. He says, uh, happy new year. I recently set up a new machine for myself from scratch, not restoring from backup. And was amazed at how slow the OS felt working in the finder. I realized why and wanted to share with you what I'd previously done to make things very snappy. He went to uh, a, a site that is a favorite of us here and uh, should be a favorite of yours or could be defaults writecom which has all kinds of great little tips for Mac OS. And he, in a specific uh, URL, he went to for speed up Mac OS high Sierra. Uh, a lot of these things still apply in Mojave. And he says it has a host of commands you can run to turn off or speed up various actions in the finder and other apps. The ones I like best are turning off the delay when showing and hiding the dock, uh, the delay when opening new windows and with quick look, he says running these commands makes my Mac feel 10 times faster, even though I know it's not really. And I just wanted to share. So we will put that link in the show notes for all of you. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jason. Cool stuff. I, there's some, there's some great things there, John. Did you check out this? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the thing I notice is a lot of them have to do with built in, protections in the OS uh, to make things seem like they're happening at a different <laughs> rate than they are. Sure. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. And that's fine. And maybe if you have an older machine, um, which Dave does not, and he'll tell us about this later, I'm sure. But um, a lot of older machines uh, do a lot of what we'll call eye candy in that they they show things. And, and a lot of these tips address that and yep. it, it's like let's turn off looking pretty and uh just remember to stay on the mic my friend yep yep now again we're we're both on ice buckets here <laughs> yeah that's right we'll, we'll post a picture of our of our podcasting setup here we we took our ice buckets and turned them over to made them into mics that is the so. best strategy for these mics here which have a yeah rather lacking stand but it's a good general purpose mic oh yeah as yeah. far as I can tell. All right, cool. Uh, so we will move on to Randall here. And Randall says, uh, if you run older Apple software, you may sometimes be confronted with having to provide a security code after, say, providing your Apple ID and password for its two-factor authentication. But if you're running older Apple software, there is no obvious place to enter it. So this is running something that needs to log into your um, iCloud account, you've got two factor authentication enabled and this, whatever it is, whichever piece of Apple software it is, does not have a place to, to authenticate that. Uh, it says this happened to me today when I gave the little used airport extreme at our beach house, a firmware update and an update uh, to my Apple ID password via the airport utility. I entered the password, hit enter, got an error message, and then a code came into my cell phone, my security device, but where to put it? Here's the magic re enter. He says, I re entered the password this time followed by the security code at the very end of my password. So if your Apple ID is, you know, you at me.com and your password is password one, well, then you would type password one for your password followed by whatever the six digit code that just got sent to your Apple ID is, and you're good to go. It'll let you in. So, Thanks for figuring that out, Rand. That's a good one. So, That's a good hack. Actually. It's a good hack. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Uh, very, very good. Very good. Uh, let's see. We have a couple of cool stuffs found, but I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is Ops Genie at OpsGenie.com. I saw a sign in the airport today, John, that encapsulates what Ops Genie does. 99.99% uptime doesn't happen by accident. You need to be on top of your stuff. And that's where Ops Genie comes in because incidents are inevitable. You just have to respond quickly. How do you do that? Well, the first step is in knowing that you're having an incident and we humans can't work 24 seven. It's just not how we are. We need to sleep. We need to do other things. So there's going to be other people that need to be notified. Even if you are the first in command there, 
if you're not available. That's what Ops Genie does, right? It empowers your dev and ops teams to plan for service disruptions by following through a series of a cascade, if you will, of who's available when, who should be notified when. If I'm sleeping, someone else should be notified. If they're sleeping, I should be notified. If I'm on vacation, it should know about that. And it does. Ops Genie manages all of this stuff so that all those critical alerts get to the right person as quickly as possible. So cool. And it allows for deep flexibility in how, when, and where all these alerts are deployed, supported by things like Jira and Amazon CloudWatch and Datadog and New Relic. Ops Genie is awesome. We've used it here and it, it did exactly that. I, there was an incident that happened and I woke up and it was solved because Ops Genie was able to notify the right people without me having to do anything. So with Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. And here's the deal. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up and get a free company account. Free. No credit card required. Free. And to that account, you can add up to five team members. That's OpsGenie.com. O-P-S-G-E-N-I-E.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie from Atlassian and our thanks to Ops Genie and Atlassian for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, a couple of cool stuffs found here. Uh, the first comes from listener David and, uh, and, and then two come from me and I'll explain why. Uh, but, uh, but first listener, David, sends in, uh, he says, I haven't heard this one on the show, but I've been playing around with it for weeks as an alternative to both stringify and ift. So these are these automation services and it's called Webcore, and it's spelled, well, it's spelled like you, like you'd think W E B C O R E, but, uh, it is W E B capital C O capital R capital E. And we'll put a link to the whole Webcore thing. This is, there's an iOS app, but it's also of course a service because that's how these things work. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Pretty cool, huh, John? I like it because I looked at it and the thing is being a coder or a software developer, I looked at the screenshots in this, uh, yeah, in this app. And it was like, if something, something, then something, something, which is typical uh, if you're not a programmer, don't be afraid. Right. But it, yeah, it looks like you can do, you can get really um, you're not stuck with what can be managed in a graphical interface. You can actually write a a path. So, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is that I looked at this, and the thing is, as a programmer, even if I wasn't, you can look at this and understand what they're trying to do yeah. and the language that they're using, which is English. Right. Or, you know, I, I suppose they... Yeah, some, I don't know if they, some derivative thereof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it makes sense. They're like, you know, if this happens, then do this. Right. And for, for most of us, that's kind of life, right? That's how it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, worth checking out. Thank you for uh, thank you for sending that in, David. Cool stuff. That's why we call it Cool Stuff Found. So, John, I've been using this um, this new MacBook Air that I got. Actually, this is the first show that we're recording from it. And uh, and it's pretty. It is pretty. Um, well, you you seem to have applied a uh, uh, coating to it. Which, well, it's uh, not a coating. It's just a plastic cover. Oh, okay. It's just a shield around Ornamental? It. Or, uh, uh, or protective. Functional? Or, yeah, protective. Yeah, okay. It's a plastic shield. Yeah, I don't... I'll put a link in the show notes to whatever this plastic shield is. I don't... Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is. But it was like 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, I'm just putting a, a note here. Uh, no, I like it. From my viewpoint, it's it's, yeah, it's an Apple clear. with headphones on it because Oh no, uh, no, no, no. So you're confused by several things oh, because okay. No, 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 no. So it's a normal MacBook Air. Then I have a sticker that Bob Levitis gave me years ago that I moved from my old Air to my new Dr. one. Dr. Bob. Yep, that has uh that has a little headphone <laughs> thing that it puts around the Apple logo. And then on top of all that, I have this plastic oh, shield to protect okay. the the MacBook Air. So, yeah, there you go. Uh all right, so I'll put a link in the show notes. It was like 20 bucks on Amazon. But the next cool stuff found is on this air, I mentioned I've been kind of going back and forth with dark mode, uh, which seems to work really well for me on a on my laptop. I do not like it on my desktop on the larger screen, but I really like it most of the time 
on the laptop. There are a few apps that I don't like it with. Uh, my calendar, for one, Busy Cal does not, to me, look like I just can't function with it that way. So I switched back and forth and I found a little app to let me do that called Night Owl that uh, is at nightowl.cramser.xyz. Of course, a link will be in the show notes. And uh, and it, it just puts a little uh, thing in the menu bar to toggle between light and dark. And you can schedule it with this. You can also set a, um, a hot key so that you can do it right from the keyboard. So Night Owl and it's uh, a donation wear, which is great. So good stuff. We should go check it out. You still don't use dark mode, right, John? Tried it. Not, Not a fan. Thing. Yeah. But hey, that's yeah. just me. Right. No, that's the beauty of it. Right. Exactly. Coolio. All right. Um, so th- this next one is a cool stuff found, but it, it, it comes in the form of a question. Uh, so it's like the Jeopardy version of, of a cool stuff found. And it comes from listener Ian who asked, Oh, I will find this here. I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, he says uh, this past weekend, I had to reset a home kit device and uh, some automation timers and rules were missing steps. The problem is I can't remember all of the steps that I had set up because home data is synced via iCloud. I was hoping to find the data location and possibly retrieve it from a time machine backup. He says, I've looked in mobile documents. It didn't show anything. I've looked in containers. I found a folder called apple.com.apple.home, but I couldn't really figure out anything. Do you know of a way to backup and restore the home kit configuration? So the answer is yes. And it comes in the form of a cool stuff found because there really doesn't seem to be a way to, if there is a way to do this, let us know feedback at MacGeekab.com. Uh, Dave, did you say feedback at MacGeekab.com? feedback at MacGeekab.com. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, I did find a third-party app called Controller. Uh, uh, it's on the App Store, and it will back up and restore your HomeKit configuration. Uh, the app is free. The backup restore functionality is part of their pro in-app purchase, which is only six ninety nine. So, uh, unfortunately, though... I don't think this is going to solve your problem, Ian, because you would need to have done this before uh, so that you had this backup to use. I don't I don't think you actually have a backup of your home con- of your previous home configuration. But again, uh, if if we're wrong on that, which, of course, we could be and maybe it would be good if we were. Let us know. So there you go. Thoughts on that, my friend? It's an interesting. So before or actually after. I got on my flight, Dave. Yeah. I then got my smartphone. Sure. To set my thermostats at my home because I'm not home, so they shouldn't be heating the house. And the thing is, before I had smart thermostats, well, I I had programmable ones. Right. But not smart ones. Right. And now that I have smart ones, which are baked into the Wink ecosystem, I actually did this uh, shortly before I left, is that I turned off all my timers saying, sure. raise it, lower it, raise it. And I said, you know what? Keep it at this temperature for this zone. Keep it at this. And the thing is, I can now monitor it. Of which course. Is yeah. the coolest thing about the smart thermostats versus the programmable ones. Right. So right. Um, the thing is, for those that don't know, I, I did have a frozen pipe event many years ago, uh, in part due to the fact that uh, maybe the heat was not on at the level it should have been. So, if for no other reason, uh, uh, all I can tell you folks is frozen pipes and burst pipes are not fun. <laughs> frozen pipes and burst pipes are not fun, no. And then you have to deal with insurance companies and blah, 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 and, yeah. and water all over the place. But um, anyways, a smart thermostat that knows these things is a, is a good thing. It, and, yeah, uh, I agree. And I'm very happy. So, so uh, cool stuff found slash quick tip here. Uh, I went earlier today, actually, uh, and did a carbon copy cloner backup or started one on Lisa's new Mac mini, which like my MacBook Air uh, has the T2 chip in it. Right. And uh, carbon copy cloner said, yeah, OK, cool. You can do this, but just know that your Mac will not boot from an external drive. It is configured not to boot from an external drive from the factory. <gasps> Security. Okay. But 
they said, you can fix this. And the way you fix this is you go to, uh, I'm going to find it here. Oh yeah. You go into recovery mode, right? So reboot command R then from recovery mode, go to the utilities menu. And there's a new option there called startup security utility. And in there you have two things to configure secure boot and external boot. So external boot has two options. You can either allow external devices to boot it or disallow by default. Disallow is set. I set this to allow because I want to be able to re recover from a clone. Secure boots. Interesting. Full. There's three options. No security, which lets you put any operating system you want on this machine. Um, medium security, which allows any version of a signed operating system from Apple or trusted by Apple. OK, and then full security, which requires at your current OS or a signed operating system that Apple uh, trusts and it's confirmed. You have to have an Internet connection at uh, installation in order for this to work. It by default is set to this full security. So it needs to be an Apple signed operating system and you need to have an Internet connection before you can install Uh Again, I chose to turn that completely off. I get why Apple's doing this. Uh, you can make your own choices about it, but uh, I have it, it. I had no idea this was there until car. And thankfully, Carbon Copy Cloner told me. So it was like, OK, great. I, I know what to do. It's no problem. It's easy. Um, it's all right there. But just bear so, that in mind. If you've got a Mac with a T2 chip, which would be something with the Touch ID sensor or the new Mac mini has it. Um, then you you want to be aware of this. So is this a facet of what they call SIP or system integrity protection? No, this is far beyond SIP. System integrity okay. protection is Mac OS protecting it, Mac OS. Mm -hmm. The T2 chip is your Mac protecting it, the entirety of the Mac. It It's what it converts or it encrypts your uh, SSD if you have one, Right. And it does not store the keys on the SSD. It stores them on the T2 chip. So your SSD is completely worthless. Even if you know the password, it's worthless without the computer that encrypted mm. it. So, yeah. No, this is this is a hardware thing. And the T2 chip does some other stuff, too. I hear that it does some... It participates in audio and, and video encoding and decoding uh, as well. I, uh, yeah. So, but yes. No, this is totally hardware far beyond sip now do you have one in your sexy new uh yeah that's what i'm saying is is the the new macbook air has mm. has the t2 chip in it too yeah yeah okay mm. i'm not sure what to think about the new the new hotness here wait till you I, see uh, the screen you'll you'll well, uh, well the thing i will uh, you sent me a screenshot of your uh, oh, ssd yeah. speeds yeah um i've never seen uh, SSD speed being four digits, so that's. Kind of I know it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For the I, read, I think the read speeds were like a thousand. Yeah, read speeds were a thousand. Write speeds were uh, four or five hundred or something. Yeah, eight, eight, still eight, 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 yeah, yeah, respectable. Yeah. It was so. yeah, it was smoking. Yeah, yeah. This thing's fast, and the, that Mac Mini's even faster, which is great. In fact, I think that Mac Mini is. Faster than every Mac available, CPU wise, every Mac available except for the I'm the fastest iMac Pro. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Put a GPU on that thing, and then you know you're good to go. I'm going to take a minute and talk about our next sponsor, which is ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is frankly the easiest VPN that I've ever used. They make this super simple. They have apps for your iOS devices, apps for your Android devices, apps for your Mac. And it literally with one click, the VPN is configured. It's good to go. And it's super smart. So most VPNs, you know, have you ever stopped to think, does it block IPv6 traffic? Like, could something get by it? ExpressVPN knows this. They block IPv6 from happening. They make sure that your traffic goes where you want it to go. And here's a cool part about ExpressVPN on the Mac, John, you can actually set it to only use the VPN on certain apps, but not others. 
and you can configure it the way you want. So if you only want your web browser to go through the VPN, or if you only want your web browser not to go through, it works, right? Anonymizes and secures your internet browsing by create, you know, this is what a VPN does. It, it creates a tunnel between you and the outside world so that whoever manages your Wi-Fi can't sniff what's going on. And this is why we're going to be using ExpressVPN all week, because we're out here in Vegas. We're going to be on different Wi-Fi. You never know who's running it and you never know who's sniffing it. But, you know, ExpressVPN is taking care of you. And you can do this with ExpressVPN for less than seven dollars a month. Right. It, and it's not just us that likes it. ExpressVPN is the number one rated VPN service by TechRadar and even comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. Really cool stuff. I, I'm totally stoked to have them on board as a sponsor. And you got to check it out because we've got a deal for you. You protect your online activity today and get three months free at expressvpn.com slash MGG. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN.com slash MGG for three months free with a one-year package. Again, visit expressvpn.com slash MGG to learn more. Our sincere thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's, uh, I, oh, we have a, a follow-up from Andrew from show 742, John. That uh, uh, it this with the, warms my heart. It, well, it should it, warm your heart. It warms it his warm time your- capsule. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we were. We were talking in the last episode about a guy with an overheating time capsule, um, and he says I had the same. He says I purchased an old older tower type Airport Extreme on eBay, and cosmetically it was fine. He says. However, when I turned it on, the fan on the bottom went nuts. Ran at a very high speed. Made a loud noise. And the light was blinking. I had never seen this before. He says, I thought it was possessed. Google Foo revealed that the airport extreme was overheating because the bottom was clogged with dust. So I got a can of compressed air and sprayed it into the openings on the bottom of the machine. That fixed it. It blew out all the dust. There was no more noise. The fan came on silently and from time to time. Oh, it came on silently from time to time and the light turned green. All good. So compressed air might have solved this problem for the other listener. And I believe we speculated that that may be a solution. Yes. When we talked about this problem. It's Dave. true. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a, a finger rag at Apple for designing things <laughs> where you could allow all this dust. So a couple of things. So number one, always check your vents. Or exhaust, or whatever you want to call it, Dave. For right. dust. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And maybe get some compressed air. But um, and another thing I'll mention is um, in certain environments, uh, number one, if you smoke, don't smoke where your computer is. Because, right. you know, the thing is the smoke gets on the chips and it insulates them and they heat up. And this is what happens. So you want to pay attention to the vents. And the uh, thermal, I, I don't know how to how to put it exactly. The thermal exhaust. Well, thermal exhaust, but yeah, just yeah. the vents. Clear the vents. Yeah, <laughs> get that compressed air. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's a uh, 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 but no, it was good to hear that um, we were not the only ones that heard about this heating problem. Yeah, or that Apple observed it. Which hats off to them to a yeah. retired product that they actually said, hey, you know, the hard drive or whatever, you know, this is heating up. So, it's heating um, up. Yeah, exactly. Watch the heat. Yeah, watch the heat. All right. Uh, let's see. We have, we've got some questions to go through here, John. Listener David writes in and says and asks, he says, uh, <clears throat> upon the migration to High Sierra, I think the system made my email account an actual gmail account uh he says uh the the problem is that i want to uh, where am i getting this he's uh okay anyway he uh, i'm just gonna cut to the chase here sorry david for mangling your email i'm doing this on on a on a it's a larger screen than i've had on the road in the past but smaller than it anyway david has a gmail account He has gone in and assigned multiple from addresses to it in Gmail. 
he used to just add those in mail as additional from addresses. But sometime around High Sierra, Apple changed the way it dealt with that. And it forced even an email account that you put in as an IMAP account. It basically forced it to be a Gmail account and it treats it a little bit differently. And he can no longer find the place to go and add these multiple from addresses to his account. So he sets up his Gmail account. But like me, you know, I run all my stuff through a, a Google Apps account that's at one domain. But I have other email addresses come to it. Some of my Mac Observer stuff, some of my Backbeat Media stuff. And I want to be able to send messages from this. So the first thing you do is you go into Gmail and you add them there. But mail doesn't automatically sync all these down. But you can do it. You can put them in there by going into mail on your Mac, go into preferences, go into accounts, choose the account, and then click on the email address that's there and edit the list and just put in all the addresses that you want. Now, if you haven't already put these in it at Gmail, you will not be able to send from them. You have to go and authenticate them on Gmail. But once you've done it there, then you mirror it here and you're good to go, which is pretty cool. Do you do that with your, you don't use Gmail as your main filter or you do? Um, I was looking through this and actually I, I find it interesting, Dave, in that it, it would seem that between iOS and macOS, you can, but as you pointed out, that the path to get there is twisted. And that if you go to one setting in macOS or iOS, it's not you there. don't get an option to right. add email addresses to the primary account. And I think that's the problem here. But they're there. And you can put them there. Now, on iOS, there you you can still set up a Gmail account as not a Gmail account, but just as a def, like a, a generic IMAP account. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to get iOS to do this with iOS Mail. You cannot add addresses to a an account that iOS sees as Gmail. So you just have to configure it as. Uh, as an IMAP account, you use imap.gmail.com as your server, and then from there it'll 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 work, and and you can and you can then go and and edit uh, all of the email addresses in that account. So yeah, gets a little nuts, but it's super handy. I I find life is much easier having one IMAP account that I check and just having everything funnel into that. Uh, makes life easier mm -hmm. on the road and and it's you know it's a little more efficient i i think in terms of checking mail and managing mail but to each our own all right let's uh let's see oh so again back to kind of getting this new uh this new machine configured i uh you know i had uh actually i had cloned it right or not cloned it i had done migration assistant from a clone of my old air. Cause I was like, great. I just want to get it up and running all good. So it did that. And I launched mail for the first time. It said, I have to create the indexes and all that. And it took whatever, an hour to go through and do all that. It's great. No problem. I was doing some searching of mail the other day and I realized I wasn't getting results before December 1st on this machine. And I knew that I had messages. And so I looked through, like I went in, like, are these messages somehow not synced down? Like what's happening? Nope. The messages are there. Search will not find them. Like, crap. Okay. So I thought, well, before I go on the road, I need to be able to search my mail. Like that. This is an, I could do other, I could do it other ways. I could go online because I use Gmail, right? I could search it there, but I wanted to be able to search it on my Mac. And is I a qualify. Because I know sometimes in the search field, you can do like from, mm -hmm. call it, you can do all, all sorts of fancy things, which actually I don't have an article and maybe we'll find one. Yeah, that's true. You can, you're you right. Yeah, you can. This is not what it was. This was that the index was munged. The in, oh. It, and so I, I ran Onyx. You would never find it because the index yeah. didn't have the data. Okay. I, and I, I told it to delete the mail index and also my spotlight index. And then I rebooted the machine. Through Onyx? Or? Through Onyx. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and that did it. <laughs> that, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, it took a long time because when I launched mail after the reboot, of course, it said, I have to go through and re-index all your mail. And it took like whatever, an hour. And, you know, mm. But once it was finished, it was good to go. So, yeah. But it was just, you know, it's just one of those things that 
things get weird. It's just how it goes. Caches. Caches, indexes. I mean, these are the things <laughs> that make your Mac seem faster, right? So, um, you know. It's well, a, they should. They should. They should. Yeah, ex- exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Indexes or indices? Um, Throw down the gauntlet. Come yeah, on. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've <laughs> seen both used, right? <laughs> Like I don't, I don't think is it is it indexes or indices? I don't know. I think it's say indices. Makes, yeah, makes you sound but but like but both words are correct. Last I checked, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I like indices. It makes you sound like more of a pompous. Yeah, it's, it makes you sound more pompous. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I like to sound pompous sometimes. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to Ed. Uh, this is what you get for. So John and I woke up on, uh, Eastern time today and we're a mess. Uh, yeah. We're recording this at, uh, 11 P it's 11 PM ish Pacific time. So you can do the math. I slept a little on the plane. You slept a little in the hotel room. I think we're, we're good. Anyway, oh, I slept on the plane too. Oh, good. Oh, see. Yeah, we're fine. Delta. I like Delta. Good. They're good. All right. Uh, so listener Ed has a question here. He says, I recently bought a one terabyte SSD from OWC for my early 2013 MacBook Pro to replace the 500 gig SSD that it came with. I want to do a clean install. My stumbling block is reinstalling my apps. My question, is there an easy way to identify apps I didn't purchase in the app store? I know that apps from the app store will be automatically downloaded, but what about those from elsewhere, such as things like keyboard maestro and OmniFocus? It seems cumbersome to print out a list of my app store apps and then cross match them with all of my applications uh, in my applications folder. Surely there's an easier way. I'm not sure there is an easier way, John. Sure there is. Okay. This is why John F. Braun right here, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Well, one thing I would do, Dave, is so if you go to your Apple menu, which we all love the Apple menu. Yeah. And I'm getting a spinning disc. Oh, boy. I may have to upgrade my computer, Dave. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a stately 2012 MacBook Pro, which still I'm happy with. But anyways, so if you go to your Apple menu about this Mac system report, you're going to see a category. Uh, a little ways down on the list here called software. And then under that is going to be applications. My humble recommendation is that you take that list and you look at it because the thing that that list shows you, Dave, is not only if an app is from Apple, but it will also show, it'll, it'll say, identified developer, which means it's a developer that has spent the money to get a signing certificate. And I assume um, the authorization to be in the app store. So you may want to look at this list just to grok what exactly you have in your machine that's considered an application and whether you should oh, keep yeah. it or not. Oh, yeah, look at that. But, but and you can you... even sort this obtained from field, too. Yes, sir. And actually, I'm now seeing, I haven't seen in the past before, but Dave, actually some things I see here say obtained from Mac App Store. Yeah. So this is perfect. Actually, the my first run-through on this, I did not see that. I saw okay. unknown, right. which means that the developer didn't, do their homework. Sure. It also shows the 64-bit status, which yeah, for those that are paying attention, uh, future versions of macOS may not support non-64-bit apps. That is so, true. So for anybody that's paying attention... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Check it out. Software, applications... Nice and, catch, man. That's great. Yeah, oh, well, Apple, awesome. There, there's a lot of good stuff in this... Uh, system information i mean sometimes it takes a while like when i ran it it took a minute or so oh yeah with this but it's it's good for you yeah it, it, it's good cool all right uh let's see moving on to listener michael and we'll find him here as i bounce back and forth <laughs> between all our stuff uh michael asks he says uh i have a large database slash set of spreadsheets in numbers i like to change the name 
when I update it to reflect the updated date, it is saved in desktop dash iCloud. When I tried to rename it to the current date and save it to my one terabyte SSD, my internal drive, I got a permissions error saying that I don't have permission to save it there. I don't want this in the cloud. I want it physically on my drive. Where does my file actually live? Is it on my drive, but backed up to the cloud? Is it only in the cloud? Why can't I move it to my internal SSD or does it already live there? And who is wheel? That's a good question. Uh, yeah. So let's, let's go through some of this stuff. So yeah. And he sent a screenshot of, of this, which shows that this file is uh, actually, it was just a screenshot of his, uh, of his drive. So, uh, well, wheel to answer in reverse. If you look, if you've ever looked at the permissions for an item, either a disc or a file or a folder, how do we do that? Uh, in the finder, highlight the item and go to the file menu and choose get info. Good question. Uh, you might see, wheel listed there wheel is a group of permissions that includes all of the system uh administrator accounts i don't i know i looked up years ago why they called this group wheel in the in the unix do you remember why they call it wheel um we have a local band called Murray the Wheel, but yeah. I don't think that's due to him. But no, um, I don't think it, it's him. It, it's a good local band. But I've also seen, Dave, I'm just looking right now at a file that I just randomly opened. Yeah. And it has a, a group called Staff. Yeah. Another one that it's kind of mysterious. So I guess my answer to you is I have no idea why okay. they choose Wheel. Other than Wheel is kind of, you know, I mean, it's a round and it's fun and... Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. If anybody knows. Yeah, let us know. Especially Apple insiders. Somebody had to come up with this. Well, name. I think, no, Wheel is a, a Unix thing. It's not unique to Apple. Oh, okay. But but I still don't know. But somebody out there will know. Somebody will let us know. <laughs> um, and we'll we'll report back. So to answer your question, the these files are, the best way to think of them is that they are actually stored in iCloud, but your Mac probably keeps a local cache of that file on hand. Depending on how you have things set, if you have it set to optimize storage or keep all your local files, um, that would that that that's sort of going to def define how iCloud syncing works and how iCloud Drive works. But if you have something that you do not want synced to iCloud, but you have documents and data or documents and desktop syncing turned on, I have a plan for you. Go into your home folder and create a new folder there, maybe call it on my Mac only, right? To stick with Apple's paradigms. And then you can save things in that folder and they will not be synced to iCloud because your entire home folder isn't synced, just your documents folder and your desktop folder and some other things, of course. But, uh, but that's what I would do is just make a new folder. It's yours. You know it, the system didn't create it, and you can put things in there, and you know that they're not going to be synced to iCloud because iCloud didn't create that folder. Does that make sense? Good? Did that work, John? Good as any. Cool. Cool. Very good. Very I good. found a wheel thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a based in the, the, yeah. Based in what? Old computer lore. Okay. Back to like, a, I found a reference to an article and they said it referred to the 10X operating system, which is like, oh, huh? okay. The heck is that? I, I, I honestly, I've never even heard of that. Huh. Huh. Interesting. 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 Cool. But I think it was talking about the big wheel. I mean, we all know about the big wheel, right? I, I, think I drove one when I was a kid. What? A big wheel. <laughs> I drove a big wheel when I was a kid. I oh, love that pedal, thing. pedal operated yeah. version. Yeah, that thing rocked. Yeah, I don't think this is that's not what they meant. What they're talking about? Okay. No, I think they're talking about the big wheel. Like, All right, the big, the big wheel, like the big cheese. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, going to let's see, where are we here? Where are we? Where are we? Let's go. Ah, uh, you know what? Um, yeah, let's go to Brian. It's good. Uh, Brian. Asked, he says, some time ago, I wrote to you about beach balls, freezing, etc., occurring on my late 2012 27-inch iMac with a one terabyte fusion drive. 
Based on some of your responses to recent callers, I suspect my IMAX hard drive might be failing. I have a one terabyte SSD in a USB 3.1 enclosure, which I've used to test my apps in newer Mac OS versions. It's currently running a six month old clone of my iMac hard drive on high Sierra. I would like to use the SSD external uh, to replace my fusion drive by cloning my iMac existing Sierra installation to it. Uh, the question is number one, do I first use disk utility to erase the SSD using up some of its read write cycles and then do the clone? Or do I number two use carbon copy cloner to clone my Sierra installation over the top of high Sierra installation? Number two, uh, number two seems like there are a lot of opportunities for errors. Number one would allow me to get rid of the high Sierra recovery partition, but are there other ways of doing this? Um, so I, I would go with option one. It's way cleaner and, and you don't want to clone to something only to inherit some weird issues. I mean, I think carbon copy cloner would take care of erasing all the things that shouldn't be there. But honestly, I think that's going to impact you more from a right cycle standpoint than just wiping the drive uh, and cloning out to it. Because wiping the drive doesn't really do anything in terms of right cycles. It just basically says, yeah, the, the data is irrelevant, right? You reuse it. Okay, good. And then, uh, yes, you're going to like rewrite everything to it. But you're going to rewrite most everything anyway. And at least this way, you're not going through and deleting stuff. And like, I, I think this is way cleaner. Just nuke it and go. I, I don't think that's going to be a problem for you. Um, that that's my thought. Brian, uh, John, do you have any thoughts for Brian here? Hmm. No, I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think he's got a good wipe it fresh, wipe it fresh. Yeah. It's, and then, and, but he could, he could take a, well, but he's going to clone out to it. So he doesn't even need to worry about, you know, what apps to install or anything like that. So it's good. All right. I want to take a minute and talk about our third sponsor, which is Captera. We've talked about them before. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software for your business, right? It, it's great. You go to captera.com slash MGG and they have over 700,000 reviews of products from real software users. You can discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Uh, you know, it. it's, do you remember 1989, John? The year the World Wide Web was invented? You know, we've come a long way in those 30 years, right? I, I remember this, right? So why does it feel like a lot of the software we use is stuck in the past? It's because... We need to find new stuff. That's why you listen to this show, to find new stuff. Well, Captera is the way some of we find some of the new stuff that we use here because it's fast, it's easy, it's great. There's more than 700 specific categories there. Again, at captera.com slash MGG, everything from project management, email marketing, yoga studio management, right? Like they really have all kinds of stuff there. And we use it too. So you got to check this out. Visit captera.com slash MGG for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And they have all kinds of stuff there. So visit captera.com slash MGG for free today to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. captera.com slash MGG. That's captera, C A P T E R R A dot com slash MGG. Just go visit today. You're going to be blown away. And our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, moving on to Dave, not me, different Dave. Uh, we'll go to listener Dave here. And listener Dave asks, he says, uh, oh, the woes. I cannot get a wired external keyboard to play nice with a 2018 iPad Pro. I eliminated every variable I can think of by trying a replacement iPad Pro, well, a USB-C travel dock from OWC, a Satechi USB-C mobile hub Pro meant for the new iPad I have, Apple's USB-C with charge-through adapter, Apple's wired magic keyboard, Mac Alley's ultra slim keyboard. No matter the combination, the same thing happens 100% of the time. When the iPad goes into standby mode, aka black screen, after I walk away, I unlock the iPad only to find that Wi-Fi doesn't work. Huh? 
Yes, that's right. A wired keyboard kills the Wi-Fi on my iPad. I have to unplug the hub the keyboard is connected to, plug it back in, and the Wi-Fi works again. What the heck? Variables I eliminated. Hubs, as I tried many. Keyboards, ditto. iPads, yep. And even in iOS, when I received my new iPad weeks after buying the original when it came out, I had to do an iCloud restore, so that was a fresh OS. Oh, and when I had those original Bluetooth issues on the first iPad, the Apple genius had me do an iTunes restore. What else could the variable be? What causes a hub and or wired keyboard combo to make Wi-Fi turn off? So I don't know that we're going to have an answer, but I, I have some thoughts about this, John, because like I do as well. It, it, like, go. I don't think it's I don't think it's randomly turning off the Wi-Fi. I, I think it's. Like it's possible to use Ethernet, right, with an iPad and you could have a USB-C to Ethernet adapter. I have one in my bag. It would plug into an iPad. So is it possible that when an iPad Pro sees a USB device like this, it's getting confused incorrectly, but nonetheless getting confused and thinking that it's got Ethernet and so it can turn off Wi-Fi and just go with Ethernet? Like, even though there's not Ethernet on these hubs, it, that's the, I don't know. Or is it saying, I, yeah. What do you think, John? What I think is when somebody says that something happens 100% of the time, that's a good data point. Because yeah. that's good troubleshooting. Right. And the thing is, if yeah. you've gotten to the point where you've tried all these things, and Dave has, the other Dave, not, not this me. Dave. Right. I, I, um, knew. I knew what you meant. It could be that the piece of hardware that you have is defective, or it could be a bug in the OS. Well, but he's he's ruled out the hardware. Two different iPads. It, and in that case, as bug I in the said, OS. It could be a bug, a, a subtle bug in the OS using I don't know if I call it exotic hardware additions, but maybe they just don't know how to deal with keyboards or, yeah. or a certain device or it could be a bug in the device itself i, I don't know right right well but, yeah wi-fi turns like, off when the machine goes to sleep it's yeah. just not turning it back on that's so, weird I mean, it could be again yeah, yeah i'm almost leaning towards it being a bug in the os and that definitely oh well should i turn this thing back on that i turned off no nah, i don't think so and it's like well no really you should yeah yeah, no, you should, it should come back on. It's just weird that unplugging USB then makes Wi-Fi. Like, there's something in there that's saying, oh, no, we're going to use network, external. But there's a kind of... Yeah, well, the USB... I mean, the USB device... Or Sorry. The Wi-Fi device is a USB mm -hmm. device, almost certainly. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how it is on a Mac, right? You, you know, it's... Oh, no, actually, it's not that way on a Mac, is it? Meh, it has been. It but. has been, but I don't think it is now. No, it's not. Is it on the, it's not on my, on my Mac. It's just a Wi-Fi device. Why would USB be getting in the way of that? No, I'm with you that it's a software thing because it, uh, the way I look at stuff, I mean, look, uh, when something's intermittent, that's when it's hardware, right? And when it's, you know, it, well. like this is software that is causing this to happen every time. It's not bad hardware. It's bad software. Now it might be bad software embedded in the hardware right but this is not just hardware gone bad it, right right it's and for for it's our software. listeners yeah part of the troubleshooting process is do this do that do that other thing or take steps one two and three right if you get the same outcome that's good exactly yeah. if you get <laughs> Not the same outcome, like you try something and all of a sudden the problem that you observe doesn't surface itself. <sighs> yeah. I mean, the other thing that occurs to me is that I, I, I you know, some people chuckle at this, but, I, but I, I've seen this actually in some accounts that I followed. They're like, a cosmic bit flip may have caused the problem. And you may laugh hilariously at my saying this, but the thing is, bits within your computer will change and may cause wreak havoc and there's nothing you can do about it. 
Mr. John F. Braun, ladies and gentlemen. I'm That's telling you, I man, I'll get ar- I, I will get articles backing up my claim here because the thing is, there are situations, my friend. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you as a computer scientist. Cosmic bit flip? Yes. All you right. can have... Co- uh, uh, but you that's have, not this. Like Dave's problem is not a cosmic no, bit no, flip. No, it's I, just I, I don't believe it improperly is. Improperly tested software. Yeah. Yes. In this case, I think it's a software bug. But, yeah. <laughs> but you could have. <laughs> I'll find it. No, I've had people refer to this. The thing is, you can have cosmic rays impact the energy within your computing device and flip a bit. That That is, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I know. I, yeah, no, you're not wrong. And even it's just you crazy. Have error correction. Yeah, if you don't choose to use it, then you right. F- and then uh, I mean, just imagine the chaos if a bit flipped and you didn't know it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair. Yeah, imagine <laughs> the chaos. Listen, folks, uh, if you wanted to be able to type the term "cosmic bit flip," cosmic bit flip. But you couldn't remember exactly what it was, or you didn't want to munge up the way you typed it. You would use the product that our next sponsor makes, which is Text Expander. Okay, because Text Expander lets you take things that you type and save them and assign them to short little snippets. So that actually, they are the snippets. They assign them to short little shortcuts, so that you could type, you know, CBF. And then that would expand into cosmic, cosmic bit, bit flip, flip, right? And then you'd get that right because it's hard to say. Uh, it's even harder to type. But there's other things that are harder to type too, like typing out an address, right? You don't want to get that wrong. You don't want to fat finger some part of your address, especially if somebody's mailing you something. You want to make sure they get the zip code right. Or in my case, I tell you every week, I live in Durham, New Hampshire. There is a more popular Durham in our country, and it is in North Carolina. (laughs) Think about how that works from an address standpoint. Durham, comma, NH versus Durham, comma, NC. If I fat finger that, my package is going to the wrong place. So you want to get this stuff right. You also want to have like all your customer service replies. You want to have them perfectly honed so that you're not making this stuff up on the fly. You're using language that you've seen, you've gone through, you've edited, you've tested, and you can sync this stuff with everyone on your team. This is what Text Expander does for you. It helps you communicate smarter all the time. And you get 20% off your first year subscription at textexpander.com slash podcast. Again, visit, it's not a mistake, textexpander.com slash podcast is where you go. On checkout, they'll ask where you heard about it. Of course, you'll choose Mac Geek Gab because that's where you heard about it. But go check it out, textexpander.com slash podcast. And our thanks to uh, Smile and the folks uh, who make Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. All right, Kevin has a stellar question here, my friend, and I will find it and I will even drop a timestamp because that's what we do. Uh, Kevin asks, some time ago, I ripped my DVD collection to my NAS using a piece of software called Rip It. The resulting disk images are in video TS folders and play perfectly with Apple's DVD player or with VLC. I recently installed Plex, however, and would like to set it up to make it easy for my non-geek family members to browse our movie collection. However, Plex does not support video TS folders. What's the best way to convert these movies to a folder that Plex does use? So uh, really the, the answer I think is handbrake here. Handbrake is, is truly built to do this. It, it, you can point it at a DVD uh, sort of, but, even easier is to point it at this video TS folder. And then from there, it will convert it to whatever you want. While you're at it, take a look at the presets in Handbrake for H.265 um, conversions. Try that uh, because it's going to convert way smaller than the H.264 ones. And see if it works with the devices that you and your family are going to use. If so, then I would just standardize on H.265 these days, these days, because it'll save you a ton of space as long as it works with the devices you have to use thoughts on any of this, John. I'm uh no, I'm good. Okay. Good. 
Now, I haven't yet delved into the uh, uh, 265 world. I'm wondering how that will work with my TiVo. Should I be concerned? Do you play movies from your TiVo? Uh, or do you use your Apple TV? No, actually, mostly I do my Apple TV yeah. from uh, from the uh, Synology. Yeah, right. Using their products. So I don't know if it... Uh, I don't know if I've actually tried it with 265, so I probably should. Yeah, try it out. I know I know the newer TiVos support, support you know, whatever they call it, HEVC or H.265. Um, oh, I, okay. There are multiple names for the same thing. It's standard. the same thing. Yeah, Apple calls it <laughs> HEVC or HE. Uh, yeah, HEVC is what they call it. No, but it's H.265 is, is what that is. Um, and I think... I think Netflix uses that too now because it's oh, way more right. efficient, right? You know, to send. And I, I'm pretty sure the TiVo Bolt uh, supports that. So the, the newer TiVos do. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. What else do we have here, John? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we have enough Synology users here. Let's, let's do this one last, one last one from Louie here. And uh, Louis writes, where are you, Louis? I got you. Louis writes, he says, I'm having a strange problem with Synology Drive, and I'm wondering if you can help me. I've set up Drive on Synology to sync folders with my Mac. So for those of you that have Synology that don't use it or don't have Synology, Drive is, uh, it used to be called Cloud Station. They're effectively the same thing, in at least in terms of the way this question is is bringing us. And it's the piece of software on your Synology that lets you set up your own Dropbox, right? So you, you put Drive on your Mac, you put Drive on, on your Synology, and you, and you can, your Mac, like my Mac right now, I just saw it syncing with Synology Drive back in my office, right? It works across firewalls and, and routers and all of that stuff, and it just lets you host your own, you know, your own repository. So it's like having your own Dropbox. Okay. Uh, he says, so I've set up Drive on my Synology to sync folders on my iMac. And of course, it also syncs on my laptop and my iPhone. Everything is working as expected between my iMac my, and my laptop and my Synology, but not on my iPhone or iPad. Using the Drive app, I can connect to my Drive folder on the Synology. But the problem is that I can't see all my files. Certain folders sync other ones. I get the syncing wheel for a moment. Then it says no items. Sometimes I try again and I get the files, but certain folders just won't sync at all. I've tried several things and I'm actually not going to go through any of them. Uh, well, because there's, there's a better way is what it is. So there is the Synology drive app for iOS and it, it has some handy things, but if you've got a lot of data out there and you just want to browse through what you have, a better way to do it is to use an app called DS file. Uh, it's also in the app store. It's also available for free. And this will let you browse the folders on your Synology in a much more, I think, streamlined way than the Drive app does. I, I keep both on my devices and, and I sort of flip-flop back and forth between them. But for what Louis trying to do here, the Drive app is frankly not the one I would use. It's the wrong one. Uh, so use the DS file app and I think that'll get you there. You've used both of these, right, John? I actually haven't delved into Drive. Oh. So, but I do use the file app. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, DS file. But the Synology apps on iOS are, are uh, for the most part, work the way I want them. Yeah. To so. uh, yeah, I think they work great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. Well, you know, it's late, John. I think... Um, especially with the idea that we have about potentially doing another episode, even yeah. just a short one this week. Um, I you think we're going to wrap band. it up here. Brought I brought the, the band. band. I did. I know. Well, you know, they travel, they travel relatively cheaply, so we can, we can make it work with them. Uh, we are here at CES and, uh, we couldn't do what we do here at CES with it, it, it well without money to be perfectly frank mm -hmm. because it it costs money to travel and all of the crazy stuff and we have some sponsors for our CES coverage uh, text expander is uh, was a sponsor of this episode in particular but is also a sponsor of our CES coverage and and this is 
site wide. So all the coverage you see at Mac Observer and all the stuff that John and I are doing from here, all sponsored by these folks. So Text Expander, Carbon Copy Cloner, which we also happened to mention in the episode, not not intentionally, but this is how it goes. And also not intentionally mentioned in the episode, but OWC. So text expander, carbon copy cloner and OWC at maxsales.com are our three sponsors for our CES coverage. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you to all of them for sure. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to, uh, thanks to you for, you know, sending in your questions and your tips and all of that stuff. It's, um, it's fantastic. We are. We Where are so can you lucky. send them? Oh, I think we already, we already did that. Yeah. If you're a premium listener, though, you can send them to premium at macgeekgab.com and come visit the forums. Visit the forums at macgeekgab.com slash forums. We uh, we would love to see you there. So that's what I have. I want to thank Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, expressvpn.com slash MGG, opsgenie.com, uh, smile, of course, with text expander at textexpander.com slash podcast, captera.com slash MGG. Those are the sponsors of the episode. Then, of course, we have bare bones at barebones.com. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. Band's getting busy out there, John. I got one more for you, Dave. Okay. Which none of the sponsors uh, brought up here, but, but I think it's a very important point, Dave, especially being in Vegas, and that is that when we are here, we won't get caught. Made up.